Okay, uh, can we start now? Uh, yes, Pak, you can right. start. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pak Arisman, for inviting me as a moderator on this uh, very important uh, event. So uh, let me start by saying that the uh, uh, thank you for uh, joining this uh, very important and uh, timely uh, event, especially for the uh, director of uh, CCS, uh, Dr. Uh, Arisman, speakers, and all the participants of this event. I think uh, the topics of our discussions uh, this afternoon is very important and timely, not only for the interests of countries in Asia, but also for the interests of um, other countries in the world for peace and security of the world, that I would like to say. As we know that the rise of China as a new superpower has undeniably is going to have a very significant impact on the world's geopolitical, <coughs> geostrategic, and geoeconomic dynamics, especially in the ASEAN region. So our discussion this afternoon will discuss the impact of China presence or hegemony on the economy politics and security in Asia. On this occasion, we are lucky to be able uh, to present six speakers who have good reputations and expertise in their respective fields. They are uh, Jason Yang, uh, Vera Mala Anjaya, Carles Tayer, Anna Agung Bayu Perwita, Koni Bakri, and Ben Blank. Now, um, let me introduce uh, each speaker now shortly. The first one is uh, Vera Mala Anjaya. Hi. A, yes, hi, hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's currently working as a senior research fellow at the Jakarta based Center for Southeast Asian Studies, Think Tank. He has been working for Indonesia prestigious English daily the Jakarta Post for over 20 years. So I'm quite sure that uh, Mr. Baramala speaks Bahasa Indonesia very well, even yeah. Japanese, right? Yeah, wrote yes. numerous of articles on international affairs, including the South China Sea conflict. And then the second speaker, Jason Yang, is an associate professor in political science and international relations at the Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, he is the director of New Zealand Contemporary China Research Center and an associate professor in the School of History, Philosophy, Political Science and International Relations in the Victoria uh, University of Wellington. The third one is a very famous observer in Indonesia, Ibu Koni uh, Bakri, is an Indonesian academic and military defense and security observer. Koni uh, completed his PhD at the University of Indonesia and um, is a visiting lecturer at the Air Force Command and Staff College in Nepal Command and Staff School, as well as regularly teaching at the Diplomat Schools of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. And the fourth one is uh, currently Tayer, is an emeritus professor 
School of Humanities and School Science, uh, sorry, and Social Science, the University of New South Wales, Canberra, at the Australian Defence Force Academy. It's a Southeast Asia regional specialist with a focus on domestic politics, foreign policy, international relations, and regional security. And the fifth one is uh, my colleague, Sana Agung Bayu Perwita, is a professor of international relations with the major concerns on security and different issues. And now is a professor at the Defense, uh, Indonesia Defense University, Jakarta. And also currently is a visiting professor at the Guangxi University, China. And the last one, Mr. Ben Blank, is the director of Southeast Asian program at the Law Institute, uh, Australia. Before joining the Law Institute, Ben was an uh, award, an award-winning foreign correspondent for the Financial Times, with postings in Hanoi, Hong Kong, and Jakarta, and experiences reporting across China and Southeast Asia over the previous uh, decade. So, um, once again, it's, um, I would like to say that we are really, you know, uh, lucky to have. Uh, six speaker uh, this afternoon. And now, uh, before we start our discussion, I would like to say uh, some few things as a follow. The first one, talk time for a speaker is uh, maximum 15 minutes due to the uh, time limitations. You know, we only have two hours. And then um, the, the second one, uh, we hope that all the participants, especially, uh, please turn off your microphone when not talking. And the third one, question can be written in the uh, chat room. It will be selected and presented to the speaker to be answered later on by the uh, moderator. So now um, I'm not going to prolong my uh, speech. Uh, now let me start with the first speaker and uh, Mr. Paramala Anjai, the floor is yours now. Yeah, thank you, Father Free. Thank you. Uh, hello. 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 Yeah, yeah. Th yeah. Uh, thank you okay. very much, Father Free, uh, pa Arisman, uh, and uh, my uh, fellow distinguished speakers from Australia, New Zealand, and Indonesia, and uh, all the viewers uh, from all over the world. A very good afternoon. Yeah. So exactly 100 years ago, on this day, uh, July 23, 1921, uh, only uh, 13 people gathered uh, in at the Shanghai French Concession Building in Shanghai. Actually, that was the beginning of the Chinese Communist Party of China because at the time they were they were uh, uh, conducting their uh, first Congress. Uh, which were, which went until July 31st. Uh, actually, the Chinese Communist Party uh, was uh, founded by two famous Chinese scholars, uh, Chen Duxia and Li Dazao, with the help of the, of course, Russian uh, Communist Party. Please, and next slide, please. Next slide, please. yeah. Uh, so, uh, but strangely, uh, both uh, founders of this communist party, uh, Mr. Chen and Mr. Li, were not there in that uh, conference. But yet, the, all the uh, uh, thirteen members they elected Mr. Chen as the secretary general of the party. But uh, the the most uh, tragic thing is the first secretary general was expelled after uh, uh, six years. Uh, that was in 1929 because he and uh, uh, Mao Zedong and uh, Stalin, they had uh, huge differences on various issues. Then uh, Mr. Lee was uh, executed by a local warlord in 1927. So the lives of both uh, CCP founders ended in tragic. Uh, but uh, actually uh, on July 1st, uh, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, celebrated the 100th anniversary uh, at the Tiananmen Square, but actually, uh, according to the CCP's own documents, it says that the party was started exactly today. Okay. Uh, uh, during, uh, but uh, after uh, several years, uh, only in 1949, 
the People's Republic of China came to existence uh, under the leadership of Mao Zedong. Uh, actually, the biggest achievement of the Communist Party of China is during the last 70 years, they transformed China from one of the poorest countries in the world to world's second largest economy, third biggest military force, and a global hegemon. As an emerging global superpower, China, which is also the world's most populous country with 1.44 billion people, is directly challenging the dominance of the present superpower, the USA. Uh, next slide, please. The Chinese Communist Party uh, is the greatest threat to our prosperity, security, and values on the face of the earth. But these are not my words. Actually, it was uh, said by US former Vice President Mike Pence. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so he said, China may not yet be an evil empire, but it's working hard every day to become one, uh, Mr. Pence said. Today, we are not going to discuss the Sino-US rivalry, but we are going to discuss about China's hegemony and what are the potential political and economic and security threats to Asian countries. Because we must remember that China is a country that is ruled by an autocratic communist party whose ideology opposes democracy, freedom, human rights, and mainly the religion. The, the CCP, the world's second largest political party with 95 million members, is notorious for its cruelty, more cruel than Soviet Union and the Nazis uh, since its birth. In 1994, the Chinese Communist Party uh, joined an alliance with the ruling uh, Kuomintang, uh, KMT. Uh, many of the CCP members at that time were admirers of the Sanate Sein, the founder of the king. KMT and the father of the nation uh, of uh, uh, the, Ch the Chinese Republic, uh, Republic of China. The same CCP broke up with the KMT in 1927, that means after Dr. Sun Yat-sen's death, and then they began a civil war uh, with uh, KMT uh, from 1927 to 1949. Millions of Chinese from both sides were killed in this civil war. Finally, the Mao Zedong uh, uh, became uh, victorious uh, and uh, he proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic of China on October 1, 1949. And uh, the Chinese uh, army, which is known as the uh, uh, military, which is known as the People's Liberation Army, which is loyal to the CCP, not to Chinese state, uh, annexed independent states of uh, Second, e uh, uh, Second East Turkestan Republic, presently called uh, Xinjiang in 1949 and Tibet in 1950. So the first thing they did was to uh, annex two countries which exist at the time inside the China. Uh, on the international side, they joined the Korean War from 1950 to 53 uh, uh, along with the Soviet Union to fight against the South Korea and uh, the US-led coalition. Uh, since the establishment of 1949, uh, in 1949, the CCP and China engaged in numerous conflicts and wars. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, see, we have so many uh, uh, conflicts, uh, including the Chinese Civil War and uh, this Battle of Chamdo, Korean War, and uh, the Taiwan crises and Tibet uprising, Xinjiang conflict, and the Sino-India War in 1962, and also Vietnam War. Uh, during the Vietnam War, China helped all these uh, uh, communists in Vietnam, as well as Cambodia and Laos. And also we have another... Uh, 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 clash with India in 1967, and also we have uh, Sino-Soviet border conflicts, and uh, 19, in 1974, uh, Battle of Parcel Islands, uh, China actually attacked North Vietnam forces and occupied the Parcel Islands, and then uh, we have uh, finally the uh, Sino-Vietnam War in 1979. And uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, not only that, actually, the most alarming uh, from the CCP rule in China is 
actually uh, in the early stages it started a, uh, a land reform movement from 1949 to 53 and suppression of counter revolutionaries and great leap forward and the worst one was the cultural revolution uh, according to us former secretary of state mike pompe over 70 million chinese people were killed under mao's brutal rule from 1949 to 1976 imagine 70 million chinese were killed uh, he called it a, a shameful legacy not worthy to commemorate or a emulation but we must remember that all these incidents and uh, clashes were occurred uh, much before china emerged as an economic and military power uh, actually the china's rise uh, began with uh, deng xiaoping's uh, uh, rise in the late 1970s at the time the china established the diplomatic relations with the us uh, then uh, actually the ccp's uh, ideology of marxism leninism and mao's thought failed to uh, uplift china it was only with the deng xiaoping's uh, 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 mr deng's uh, reforms china uh, introduced a hybrid capitalist and socialist system moving away from the doctrinal socialism china joined the world trade organization in 2001 which uh, accelerated china's economic growth further china has now became the world's largest exporting country i think its exports last uh, year was around 2.59 trillion dollars of exports uh, china has uh, uh, it, uh, china's economic wealth did not change the behavior of the uh, ccp because in 1989 china suppressed uh, the students uh, protests at tiananmen square brutally and millions of uyghur muslims are being put in concentration camps now recently it also uh, ended democratic movement in hong kong next slide please uh, so uh, actually the Ch uh, china uh, next slide please yeah actually uh, china uh, its main uh, uh, initiative to dominate uh, the world uh, economy is the uh, uh, belt and road initiative uh, which covers 68 countries in asia africa europe and south america uh, with an estimated investment plans of 1 trillion dollar but we don't know how it will end up so how to deal with china's hegemony what are the potential threats to asian countries first we go for the political in, uh, threats china is the world's largest surveillance state it spends actually more money on internal security than external security freedom of expression human rights and right to worship are denied to chinese in china democracy has no place in chinese political system chinese media is fully controlled and censored by the chinese government muslims in xinjiang buddhists in tibet and christians in china do not have enough freedom to practice their religions china follows a saying that it does not matter whether a cat is a white or black as long as it catches mice military dictators strong men and military supported regimes are very happy with china uh, myanmar's military junta north korea's uh, kim jong un cambodia's strong man hun sen and military supported pakistani prime minister imran khan or uh, great fans of china and the ccp because no questions asked and they will get full support for their regimes from from china uh, so asian countries should be vigilant while dealing with china in the past china has a, a, a had a history because uh, before uh, 1962 both india and uh, china Uh, had a perception of uh, hindi chini chini bye bye chinese and indians are brothers but suddenly uh, uh, the china attacked india in 1962 and uh, seized control of aksai Ch aksai chin area in jammu and kashmir state likewise china had helped a lot uh, the communists in vietnam but the same china attacked vietnam in 1979 and also uh, in 1974 it seized the parcel islands and also uh, 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 in 1988 uh, 
uh, it also seized uh, Johnson South Reef in the Spratly Islands. So in 1969, uh, which actually the Chinese Communist Party was supported in the beginning from the Soviet Union, but again, it had border clashes with the Soviet Union. So be careful uh, with the Chinese uh, now, the 5G technology, smartphones and laptops, which have the potential uh, to monitor your activities without your knowledge. Next slide, please. China always undermines global norms and values. It signs agreements, but never respects them. We have so many examples. Uh, next slide, please. We have so many examples. For example, in 1992, China signed the UNCLOSE and also the DOC in 2002, and also including the, the permanent port of arbitration uh, in the Hague. So, uh, so, but the same China, which is refused to uh, implement the PCA's reward as well as the DOC, uh, as well as the unclosed. So that's why it is a very, uh, uh, we have to be very careful. And now we can go what kind of economic threats we will face. China is undoubted, undoubtedly world's second biggest economy uh, with its GDP of $16.64 .6 trillion. And it is also the biggest manufacturer. It are, are basically why uh, the problem from uh, problem with China is it ad adopts predatory economic practices like uh, providing huge subsidies, low taxes, and cheap finances to Chinese companies. Uh, the the theft of intellectual property rights and forced tech transfers are rampant in China. It ignores lay labor and environmental standards. Many countries in the world found that it would be very difficult to benefit uh, by doing trade with China. Let us see the example of Indonesia. Uh, so Hello. <laughs> I think you got a problem with your voice, uh, Mr. Paramala. Hello. Pak uh, Aris, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe Pak Paramala have a okay. problem with connection. Okay. Uh, Pak Paramala. Um, Okay, uh, can we contact uh, Mr. Paramala by uh, WhatsApp and yeah. or we can continue for the next speaker? Yeah. Hello. Well, um, I think we can continue to the next speaker, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Can we just go on? Yeah, Since let's I go know. on. Yeah. Okay. Now, okay. before we uh, go to the next speaker, so a couple of points I think is very important from uh, Mr. Paramala. Uh, the first one is uh, I think uh, there's a kind of recognition that the China hegemony already happens in regions, especially in the Southeast Asia. Um, it can be seen from the uh, improvements of the China in many conflicts in the area, according to Mr. Paramala. Um, why this happens, uh, Paramala uh, highlights the uh, roles of domestic political characteristic of the system, which is influenced the uh, China's foreign policies, you know, especially uh, um, its behavior in, in region in the many aspects like economics, uh, politics, and also in security. So, uh, in, the, in the in the case of the uh, uh, current impacts uh, of this kind of uh, foreign policy, uh, Mr. Paramala highlights about the, what happened in South China Sea issues, you know, where uh, uh, China is uh, so is a great aggressivities uh, in, in this uh, area. In the, in the economics, uh, uh, 
Paramala uh, also underlines about the uh, imbalance, you know, I may say the imbalance of the trade between the uh, ASEAN and other countries and uh, China. So it's why uh, there is kind of problem actually in, in the uh, uh, trade and economic relations with all, all the countries in region and the uh, uh, China. But unfortunately, uh, Mr. Paramala, you know, got a problem and then we can then uh, move to the next speaker and uh, Mr. Jason Young, we now uh, please you know, to uh, present uh, your presentation. Sorry. Okay. Jason Young, the time is your. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Dafri and Dr. Arisman for the invitation uh, to speak today. I'm just going to share my slides um, and start. Right. So um, thank you for the invitation to speak. And um, today I would like to uh, really just make three very quick points in the time that I have. And the first point, I'll be looking at a couple of observations of Chinese foreign policy behavior. Uh, and there I want to make a distinction between uh, issues around the periphery and issues in the more uh, international space. Uh, secondly, I want to sort of think about this question of competition and also the question of hegemony and how we define that and what we're actually seeing there. Uh, and then I want to, um, my third point, make a, a few comments on this question about threats to Asian countries. Um, and there I'll bring in uh, just a couple of ideas from New Zealand. So uh, to begin, if we're looking at uh, Chinese foreign policy, I think uh, many people would agree that over the last few years, the key thing that has changed is that Chinese foreign policy is now more assertive uh, and they seem more um, interested in pursuing their interests, uh, even at raised costs. Um, but there's also two different types of um, foreign policy activities that are going on. So in the periphery, uh, I would argue these are questions more about state building. Uh, so we have assertive foreign policy in terms of the type of state that, that the Chinese Communist Party wants uh, consolidation of one party rule. Uh, and of course that challenges international norms of liberal democracy. Uh, in terms of territorial disputes, we see it in the South China Sea. Uh, we see it in Diaoyu or the Senkaku Islands. And of course that challenges international law. Uh, we see it in, in Xinjiang and in, in Xijiang or Tibet. Uh, and of course there it raises very, very concerning questions uh, around human rights uh, with the incarceration of um, millions by many estimates of uh, Uyghur and other Kazakh people in Xinjiang. And of course, we also see it in terms of Hong Kong, um, where we see the uh, uh, Sino-UK uh, agreement on the handover of Hong Kong to return to the people to China and become part of the People's Republic of China, we see this breaching of an international agreement. Uh, and also again, this breaching of this idea of international norms of liberal democracy. Uh, and then in terms of Taiwan, we also see questions around, I guess, threats to regional security and disruption to regional security patterns. So they are the sort of international relations issues in terms of China's periphery. If we move to, um, Instead, looking at more internationally, we've seen that China has become, well, the People's Republic of China and the government have become far more assertive and pushing back on um, some of the most strategic and important relationships that it has. Uh, so you will remember earlier in the year when Yang Jiechi, when he uh, had a meeting in Anchorage uh, with the United States, um, when Anthony Blinken, one of the most famous quotes from that talk was um, or the Chinese people are not going to take this. Uh, and he also talked about uh, how um, America or the United States no longer had uh, the status or the position to talk down to China. So from this, we can see that, that there's, uh, the People's Republic of China now feels confident and powerful enough to push back against the, the world's leading superpower. 
We also see the competition between the US and China uh, in the security area and economic area in terms of technology and also this very strong ideological competition. In terms of economic power, uh, and we've already had a, a good discussion of this, uh, we see that China is now uh, refashioning uh, global value chains to fit its interests. Uh, we see uh, very concerning questions around how economic power is used in terms of relations with countries like Australia, uh, where there's uh, criticisms that China is, is using economic coercion uh, to punish Australia for certain political positions it's taken. Uh, and we also see ideologically China pushing, or the Chinese government pushing uh, new ideas for international relations. They call it Xinjiang Guoji Guanxi, or a new type of international relations, uh, and also a community of shared future. Uh, and perhaps most concerningly, we see that internationally, there, there appears to be this ongoing, uh, I guess, chip on China's shoulder, this uh, combination of both being feeling like a victim, um, but also being uh, assertive about its interests. So how can we explain, uh, I guess, this shift to a more assertive foreign policy? Uh, well, I think, uh, I guess the way I would explain it and the way most people would explain it is that it's, it's a question of China becoming uh, a great power. It's the second largest economy in the world, uh, the biggest trader for most countries, uh, certainly in Asia. It's a leading technological power, um, as it says here, a Kirti Changguo, or a scientific superpower, or strong country. Uh, and it's uh, the, the, still the largest country by population. Uh, and of course, it has a rapidly expanding military uh, which is, is very important for understanding its position in China. Uh, and just recently at the 100th uh, anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, we saw that Xi Jinping uh, made the statement that Changguo, Bishu Changjun, Jun Chang, Tainan Guoan, this idea that China must, that a strong country must have a strong military, uh, only if the military is strong can a country be secure. And this is straight out of the playbook of, of any great power. So like any great power, um, China's ability to pursue its interests has increased within the region um, and its desire to shape that region and to shape the world to meet those interests has also increased. And of course, this is something that we're not uh, used to. But on top of that, it's not just that China has become a great power, <clears throat> but it's a particular type of great power as well. Uh, so this is only half of the story. Uh, China is not a liberal democracy. It's a Leninist party state. It's not a regulatory market economy. It's a socialist market economy. It's not um, what the other great powers over the last couple of hundred years has been. Uh, it's Confucian. It's legalist. It's a socialist power. Um, and so we have to learn to live or we have to learn how to push back or how to adapt or how to accommodate how we live with this new great power. Um, and this new great power, in the words of, of Xi Jinping, the new great power that believes it's a new era and it's a new era uh, for, for Chinese style socialism. But on top of that, it's even more complex because with China's rise to great power status, we've also to see the emergence of a rivalry, uh, a rivalry very much in Asia in this US-China competition. And it's a rivalry, I would argue, for hegemony, uh, hegemony in Asia. <clears throat> so of course, China, if you read its documents, would like to uh, have more say and more power within the region. And of course, the United States is fully committed to maintaining its security and economic and diplomatic presence in the region. So as um, Jesse et al in Beyond Great Powers and Hegemons, as they argue a hegemon is a significantly stronger uh, uh, economic and military than other states, is aware of its preponderance and is willing to use that to shape its international environment to its interests and values, uh, and is active in building international institutions. So I would simply argue here that both the United States and China meet all three criteria in Asia. And so we have this competition for hegemony 
in the region. And what's most important in that competition is how other states, particularly Asian states, respond to that competition. So what we've seen uh, in, in, in a different example is um, in, in the New Zealand case, in the South Pacific, and also in many Pacific countries, is we've seen states trying to avoid openly taking sides uh, in this strategic competition, but at the same time, tidying up and making it quite clear where their preferences lie. We see it in terms of technology for 5G, overseas investment, uh, sort of tidying up around donations for political parties, foreign interference, debates and discussions about um, trade diversification, um, becoming more outspoken in terms of values and interests, um, adopting regional frameworks like the Indo-Pacific uh, and New Zealand adopted the Indo-Pacific in a very similar way to how Southeast Asian states adopted that known. And also more recently, publicly attributing um, cybersecurity attacks to China. So we also see uh, states like New Zealand avoiding open discussion of strategic competition, but at the same time, making a lot more effort to work with others to deal with questions of asymmetry. And so the asymmetry in the relationship between New Zealand and China uh, is, is, is massive, as you can imagine. So for New Zealand, that's meant um, deepening relations with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, with Australia, our closest partner and ally, uh, with the Five Eyes countries, with the European Union, uh, etc. And so these various coalitions are often based around different issues. Um, and so these shifting coalitions are one way of um, assuring the problem of asymmetry uh, when it comes to dealing with a more assertive China can be balanced out. And so to conclude, um, I would suggest that the threat to Asia countries in terms of the emergence of China as, as a, as a uh, great power and the great power competition for hegemony in the region is that if Asia became an Asia without the United States, that would be incredibly problematic because there would be no great power to balance uh, China. Or if Asian states made a false choice and bind themselves to one great power only, that would also be a problem. Um, and I also think that another threat would be for Asian states to not recognize that their agency collectively to work together to manage and to temper great power competition is also very important. So I'll leave my comments there and I look forward to the questions and discussion. Uh, thank you very much um, for such uh, insight uh, presentations, uh, Mr. Jason. I think uh, there's some points uh, made by uh, suggestion. The first one is uh, um, China foreign policy, you know, uh, recognizes one of the most assertive uh, foreign policies of the countries in region till now. I think this is a, uh, one of the uh, important points we have to look at, you know, the uh, phenomena where uh, China is becoming more and more assertive in region. Uh, even in the uh, high cost, uh, that's a, uh, uh, what why that's happened according to uh, Jason is, uh, you know, to some extent related to the, uh, again, you know, the domestic politics, especially in the state buildings uh, um, of China. Uh, but uh, a couple of things also uh, need to be uh, uh, noted, I think, about the, uh, the character of the uh, Chinese foreign policy, which is tend to confronting with the international norms and what actually, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, including the uh, phenomenal uh, 
uh, of the China foreign policy to break the international norm and law. But uh, Jason uh, also make notes about the uh, China's uh, so confidence, you know, and strong, you know, how to be a uh, world uh, leaders or also in the uh, achieving the its uh, national interest. China has a modality to achieve this all uh, its uh, national uh, interest, uh, such um, uh, because the strong uh, economics and the uh, military and so on. Um, in interestingly, that the uh, it national uh, what call it you know, here uh, defense and security with the global norms. So once again, you know, that the uh, China foreign policy is an attempt to code in code in you know, confronting the uh, against you know, the global norms or like uh, liberalism, democracy, and so on. And the last one, um, I think suggestions you know, uh, suggest some uh, thing that we can that can be done by the uh, countries in region like uh, how to uh, deal with the uh, China in the context of China rivalries with the US. Yeah, uh, I just want to try to suggest about how to, let's say, uh, manage a kind of um, symmetric relationship uh, based on the experience of the uh, New Zealand relation with the China. I think this is uh, some of the points. Um, we can discuss this uh, uh, further in the next uh, session. And then now uh, we move to the third uh, speaker, Ibu Koni Bakri. And now the floor is yours, Ibu Koni. Please, 15 uh, thank, minutes. Yes, thank you, Pastor Fri. Uh, thank you for pa Arisman and Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Uh, let me share my uh, PowerPoint uh, so I can make it fast. Okay. And I'd like to, okay. Uh, so my, my title is about the tension and threat of Gozia, China military and economic hegemony. So the question is, uh, we are really have to emphasize on the words of hegemony and what uh, hegemony means. Okay, if you are talking about the hegemony, actually uh, we uh, hegemony in the political and economic or military predominance or control of one state over the others, which is in ancient Greek, is about the, uh, the political military dominance of one city state over another city state. But in the 19th century, it could be used for the geopolitical and the cultural predominance of one country over others. And the political of the international political economy, Jayanta Jaiman writes, if we consider the Western dominated global system from our early years of 16th century, there have been several hegemonic powers and content that have attempted to create the world order in their own image. So let's see this one. Hegemonic power from the 16th to 21st century, I mean, from France on 1643, since Louis XIV, uh, uh, Seven Years' War, and then Britain, and then this and that. I'm not going to, uh, to read uh, one by one, but again, uh, we can see that British Empire was primarily the seaborne. Many British uh, positions is were located in, around the uh, rim of the Indian Ocean, as well as the island in the Pacific Ocean. And the Caribbean, uh, Britain also controlled the uh, Indian uh, subcontinent and large uh, portion of Africa. In the early century, uh, uh, 20th century, I mean, France, UK, Italy, is, uh, and Soviet Union, later Nazi German, is uh, all either maintain uh, imperialist policy based on the strength of influence. But the French politician Hubert Fredrin uh, stated that uh, US as a hegemonic power or hyperpower because of its uh, unilateral military action worldwide. Uh, Therefore, uh, the Zosion, uh, Zosion said that a third way of hegemonic of that style hegemony apart from the uh, peaceful or violent hegemonic may be arise in the most uh, feasible option to describe China in its global hegemonic uh, future. Again, uh, we are talking about the hegemonic. What does hegemonic mean? I mean, if you are, you are uh, talking about what uh, Robert Kiyohane state, is he really emphasizing on the raw material, on capital flow, on uh, import, on goods uh, with high value added, which is emphasizing on academic entry. But I'm going to really switch to the Susan Strange thinking about what does hegemonic mean? It means they have to have a four elements, security, production, financial, and knowledge. Now talking about these four elements, I think China has it all. It's not only about trade and about economy. So let's talk about now the China national strategy, foreign policy, military, and economic power. 
Uh, PRC strategy aimed to achieve the great uh, rejuvenation of the China's nation by 2049 uh, by the expanding China national power and perfect in government system. And CCP forms the strategy as an effort to realign long held national aspiration to return China position uh, of a strength, prosperity, and leadership on the world stage. And the PRC foreign policy seeks to adjust the aspect of the international order with accordance with the ideas and principles which is few essential for range, uh, forging in external environment conductive to China national rejuvenation. This is we have to really underline. And therefore, since 2019, recognized that uh, PLA should take a more active role in advance of foreign policy. And of course, and uh, intensify the overall development, including the economic and uh, armed forces. So if you see, actually the, the fusion of the military civil uh, fusion of uh, uh, economic and uh, military fusion, uh, civil fusion, is really bring the development to the PRC because PRC pursue MFC development. Um, okay, let me tell you, I think MFC is some MCV. It's something like, uh, we call it, uh, apa ya, uh, uh, Rifungsi Albri, maybe something like that. It's actually development strategy that which is fusing economic, social development, uh, uh, integrated the security strategy and build uh, the security national strategic system. So M MCP has broader purpose, which is uh, acquiring uh, foreign technology, meaning uh, there's a clear line between the PRC civilian and military economics. I mean, there's no clear line between the civilian or military economics. And, and China economic development support military modernizations uh, to the large defense budget. And it detects not only uh, a large defense budget, but as well as the growing national industrialization, technological and innovation base. So we are, we are talking about uh, what is military civil fusion or refunctioning China is actually they have a six interrelated efforts. First is fusing the China defense industrial base, uh, which is civilian and technology and industrial base, uh, integrating the uh, leveraging science and technology or innovating across military and civilian uh, sectors, cultivating talents on, on blending military and civilian expertise, and then uh, Mostly uh, is expanding and, uh, uh, and de uh, depending the China's uh, national defense mobilization system to include all relevant aspects, which is uh, economic for its competition uh, and war. Uh, so China rapid economic growth. There's two main factors, I think the, the most very important one. The first is the uh, large scale uh, capital investment, which is financed by large domestic saving and foreign investment. Second one is the rapid productivity growth. And these two is really inter, uh, interfacing between each other, which is appear together hand in hand. And why China is success, success, successful? Because it's enjoyed 30 years of explosive growth. Yeah, it's, we cannot deny it. <laughs> and then uh, why, why they, uh, it could be success? One of the, uh, the, one of the, the, the way is because uh, the, common, uh, the common economy, which is China's government spending, has been a significant driver of its growth. Therefore, today, United States have uh, around 1.1 trillion uh, 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 owes uh, by China. They broke the trillion dollar mark by 2011. What this did now is 40% uh, 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 belong to, no, 50% uh, belong to Shanghai Sandy Group, TikTok owned by Beijing based company, this and that. I'm not going to talk uh, uh, deeply about it, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that actually a lot of things uh, uh, now is belong to China, including the American multi cinema, General Motors, uh, uh, Snapchat. Hilton Hotel and so on and so forth. Why? Again, I think China is emphasizing on the joint ventures. Uh, and th this is very important one because the first is a strategy that joint ventures are formed on the same model and follow the same internationalization strategy. But the second one, interestingly, is strategy is set by the PRC. So China has the two, these two models. First is the model of international uh, model. Second one is, more, um, uh, is uh, uh, done by PRC, which is PRC doesn't care about resource, about expenses, about profitability, because they are really operate on the, uh, on the capitalism, which is a company that is stated to become an uh, insidious war of organization. So of course, this is a become, uh, uh, you will see uh, one by one from here. And if we see on the 2025, Indonesia average will be on 544 to 9. On the 2025, Asia will be on 18,000. Uh, 2025, the GDP will be 20,000. If you see from uh, the situation of China today, they reach, they reach that position already. Uh, and we'll see that one uh, later more uh, deeply. Again, the defense policy, uh, the PRC has stated as defense policy aims to safeguard its sovereignty, security, and development interests. And uh, PLA remain primarily oriented towards a longstanding regional threat, but now is more to the uh, 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 China defense policy, policy and strategic uh, military on global, uh, greater global role. And China leaders stressed to imp imperative of the meeting key military transformation markers in 2020 uh, 20 and 2025, uh, I mean 35. 
So the world class military within the context of China national strategy will be achieved soon. I think maybe it's even, even faster than the target, uh, the, uh, China target. So modernization of China armed forces in the new era is uh, not only continue to make progress implementing major structural reforms, but as well as uh, talking about how the, uh, this is including shipbuilding, which is the PRC now is the largest Navy in the world with uh, overall battle force is approximate around 350, which is uh, America, United States, I mean only 293. Uh, Land-based conventional ballistic and cruise missiles, integrated air defense system, which is uh, built uh, very well. Now I'm talking about uh, the region. Don't forget that China trying to uh, still uh, balance uh, this, uh, this region, because if you can see from France concept, France uh, since President Macron is stated the own grand puissance or the France as a, a great power, which is clearly saying that uh, France is uh, the great power of the Indo-Pacific. And Macron said that uh, the France as a resident power within the region, that therefore France have a prominent role to play in this region. And of course, French strategic role in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, including the defense partner. Then of course, uh, again, the sovereign power of the Indo-Pacific region where they bring significant contribution to peace and security. And therefore, France have about six or five uh, uh, pointers of how to contribute stability on the Indo-Pacific. I'm not going to read that one by one, uh, by one, one, uh, one by one. British UK, UK as well. Uh, UK uh, uh, issued the, the document of UK tilt toward the Indo-Pacific, which is worse. UK doesn't seek any new world court wars. A UK government cannot take neutral position between Beijing and Washington, uh, nor should itself, uh, this is very interesting, it's a, 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 a new, a new non-aligned movement or small state in the position. So, so he, uh, UK doesn't take the position of neutral position, doesn't take the position of non-aligned. And Britain should defend global cooperation openness and the UK would articulate clear statement of the guiding principle. What is going to UK, uh, UK going to do is the economic security and the failure will be uh, hand, in, uh, hand in hand. So Chats Garia, uh, Deputy Assistant of Secretary of Defense for China, is really emphasizing on, the, uh, on this, uh, only the market, on not only the defense budget, but by, by a single variable, which is a total number of vessels, tonnage, location, capabilities, posture, activities, and how this uh, global PLA military logistic network could interfere US military operations. Uh, I'm going to be very fast, uh, I must finish. So the PLA overseas basing and access is beyond its current base in Djibouti. Is uh, PRC very lucky to uh, consider several uh, places for the NAFA Air Force and uh, Ground Forces. The PRC consider location for uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, United Arab Emirates, Kenya, Sicily, Tanzania, Angola, and Tajikistan. So far that I know PRC and Cambodia who have uh, publicly denied having signed an agreement. So actually, the global military, military logistic network could again interfere with U.S. military operations. Capability of the PLA uh, again, the, uh, really developing on capability to provide option for the PRC, and really emphasizing on Taiwan contingency. For regarding Taiwan, I like to emphasize. I think we have to be very clear. Are we going to use uh, China uh, one one China policy or two China policy? Because if we are not clear about that, uh, Taiwan is going to be a very big issue here. Uh, Anti-access array, de array denial, of course, and then the, how the uh, additional strike uh, air and missile defense. So uh, last, but I think it's more finished. Uh, I think in the in the uh, in the tutorial, uh, it is about who who needs democratic friends. Is China needs another democratic friends? Uh, I don't think so, <laughs> because if we see from that uh, all elements, China really have um, uh, uh, officially uh, uh, ally, which is not Korea. But again, with the United States, actually the relation is very good, except maybe uh, there are unresolved concerns regarding the role of democracy and corruption in China. But uh, again, uh, China is very advanced on the PLA strategic uh, support force, uh, the uh, space enterprise, and the, all the space operations. So do we really need to stop China to re rebalancing other hegemonic power and strategy? Because I'm talking about the France and UK here. I'm going to talk about the Indonesia position, how we are going to, to, pay off to face this French President Macron Le Grand Puissant, how we are going to balance our Britain vision uh, and then FPDA, NATO, Japan, uh, Japan, I mean, with Shinzo Abe, Fusatsu no Umi no Majiwari, which is like uh, two ocean policy, something like that. NATO, Australia with the, uh, the, the New Zealand, Aosan, Zukus is strategic alliance, and this, uh, this and that. I mean, it's, this is going to really uh, re bring risk of breaking ASEAN. And if we see the Indonesia power toward China, 
let's talk about the GDP. From the GDP, Indonesia is actually balancing uh, uh, Leoning, Sangsi, and Hainan. From the GDP growth, we are only balancing uh, Mongolia and Jilin. And GDP per capita, uh, Indonesia is only balancing Heilongjiang, Tibet, Shanshan, Sichuan, Gansu, and Xiangxi. So we really have to think about it. This is how China developed and, and, and shared their, their uh, economic power, which is, of course, is going to be uh, with the PRC state, uh, its defense policy aims to safeguard the sovereignty and the economic and the development. So I'm going to close my, 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 my presentation with, with this. All politics is cultural and all politics is local. China has strong tradition of collectivism and even authoritarianism. So underpinning the Chinese traditional values and beliefs such as the importance of the order ref, uh, reference for authority, virtue of plurals, and most commonly the collectivism or unity is very important. That's why we have to really understand what is the, what is the word country in Chinese, Gojia. Gojia means is the kingdom and family. This is very inter, uh, uh, interventing. American hegemonic dream is inspired individual creativity, productivity, and positivity, such as a uh, presented global scale as the world dream. So the individualism that prevailed in Western society and political crisis of hundreds of years has reached different results with China thousands of years tradition of collectivism and even authoritarianism. So Indonesia have a very, very uh, big uh, uh, homework of this. First, we have to very, be very, very clear clear on statement of dream position as the supra strategic with the small GDP and armed force uh, capabilities, not safe. And with the plastic non-alignment movement and global monetary vision. Why I have to underline the non-alignment one? Because uh, as you said, uh, I mean, as you see, Britain doesn't take position of non-alignment. So is there possible a country in the Indo-Pacific, including Indonesia, take the firm lead in shaping clear set of mutually shared hegemonic regional dreams? Why I said mutually shared hegemonic regional dreams? Because now Macron is here, uh, I mean, is here, France with the dream, uh, UK with the dream, everybody with uh, their own dreams, including China. And how we are going to balance these uh, dreams, value, and aspiration for the future Indo Pacific economic military relation. I'm going to close with this one. First of all, we have to understand China, we need to understand conventional versus unconventional wisdom. We have to see the major foreign policy initiative for four decades that China have. And I think one belt, one road is an initiative as long as the country knows what they want with the dealing actually open opportunity to everyone because actually one belt, one road is built uh, another 55 country around the region. Uh, thank you. And I take this one as a, a closing a statement because I, I like the Yukon Huang debunking myths about China's economics. I think the book is launched three years ago. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ibu Koni, for again you know, such uh, enlightening uh, uh, presentations. Uh, I think these are uh, uh, really interesting when you, uh, uh, Ibu Koni, you know, uh, make uh, some notes just about the, uh, the current China uh, foreign policy behavior. Uh, first of all, I think uh, I think it's uh, worth it to note that the China already prepared itself to be a hegemon you know, since a long time ago in 1949, according to Bo. Uh, and then uh, that's been done you know, in the many uh, sectors, economics and uh, politics and domestic politics and also in foreign policy, including the uh, military strategy. Uh, and also, uh, Ibu Koni uh, make a notes about the uh, how to deal with this kind of the um, China's you know, assertive behaviors. Uh, um, looking at the, what the uh, French and UK you know, done, I think uh, I think it's also it's I think good. You know that they, uh, there's a kind of phenomenon where uh, international response to the Chinese. Uh, uh, growing power in region is uh, quite uh, uh, what you call it, you know, uh, strong and responsive. Although they have their own strategy, you know, I think uh, in relation to the uh, uh, what the Jason already mentioned before, you know, what the uh, regional countries need actually how to uh, manage the issue with China by uh, you know. In, balancing kind of balancing relationship i think this is a uh, there are a lot of issues that we can be discussing now in, in the next season thank you very much uh, 
Bukoni, and then we now move to the uh, next speaker, and uh, Mr. Kas Kali uh, Tayer. The time is your now. Yes, thank you. Uh, my slides could come up, please. And while that's happening, I would like to thank the Center for Southeast Asia Study Indonesia for the invitation to join you virtually uh, tonight. Uh, my presentation is a Gemini with Chinese characteristics. And if I could have the next slide, uh, please. My overview is, uh, it touches on some of the defined hegemony briefly, hegemony with Chinese characteristics, apply that to the Asian context, uh, conclude by looking at cont contested hegemony of the regional order and steps individual and collective countries might take. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go into the academic literature. We have three made schools of thought, liberalism, realism, uh, and constructivism plus side schools, but I'm doing an eclectic approach. Uh, we've already heard it's about material, the preponderance of material power that's been identified. Not stressed so far, I think is the kind of, but not only does a power have to, a hegemony have to have, have the dominant material power, it has to exert leadership and want to. And it could be dominating or coercive or uh, consensual or persuasion, and they're not dichotomy. You can have mixes of both. But next, when constructivism, and it's a component not yet discussed, is the relation between the hegemon and the subordinate states. And some of that came up with Jason Young. They have agency. And to be a hegemon, you have to have uh, social recognition. The US was recognized after the Second World War, and people comply. They benefited. Uh, but do countries in the pushback now really view or want to accord that recognition to China. And finally, it's the structure of the international system. Uh, and is, is it hierarchical uh, ordinarily? Next slide. So hegemony with Chinese characteristics, we've heard uh, in this, my, my quick historical overview, is overcome the century of humiliation, uh, restore China's pre-colonial spheres of influence. China confuses the so-called tribute system with its supremacy over the region. Uh, you have concentric circles of influence focused on Beijing, uh, supplant the, the liberal international order by creating, by joining and, subvert, and subverting existing institutions, if you will, but to create China-centered multilateral institutions and to undermine the US alliance network by displacing the US military power from the first island chain. And uh, just, as, just to a point that Xi Jinping says the Chinese nation does not carry aggressive or hegemonic traits in its genes. And I guess a hegemon is in the eye of the beholder. Next slide, please. I attended a very important meeting in Canberra uh, under Chatham House rules. And I'm, I'm using the ideas of a globally eminent China scholar completely fluent in the language who's visited the country 120 times. And he lists the eight objectives in descending order, but they're not it's hard to separate them. And we've heard some of them, uh, keeping the par party in power, uh, uniting the national territory, develop the economy, uh, environmental protection. But the, I'm highlighting the, the parts of hegemony to develop a first-class military appear to the US. We've heard that. Next slide. Uh, push the US back from the first island chain. That repeats what I've already said, because that's for the security of its second strike nuclear deterrent. It's nuclear ballistic missile submarines based on, on, on Hainan Island and a naval base there. Continental security through the Belt and Road, grow markets, gravitational full towards Beijing. And my expert concludes to create an international system with China at the center. And these concentric rings all build up to Beijing so it can shape a rules-based international order. Next slide, please. Uh, I, okay, uh, hegemony with Chinese characteristics. We've, heard, we've had this before. It, it has the material power, the population, economy, the military, Coast Guard and fishing fleet, I would add, um, the largest shipbuilding industry by weight, and it's developing a credible nuclear deterrent. If we could move on, the next slide. The leadership style, uh, in that 100th anniversary speech, Xi Jinping pointed out that China was a rising global power and a new model for human advancement. 
It's a promoter of Asian values, commonalities between the region as opposed to the West, a provider of public goods, beneficence, and that goes back to the tribute system. Um, many of the, the countries that sent tributes came back richer uh, than when they went to China, but China rewards compliant states, Cambodia. Cam it does not tell Hung Sen what to do. Hung Sen knows what to do and gets rewarded for it. Uh, to give small states and medium states high level political attention uh, in a way that maybe other powers haven't been able to do, but in that leadership style, it can be coercive bullying and intimidation towards recalcitrant states. And I'm not gonna dwell on Australia, but Jason Young uh, pointed that out. Next slide, please. And now in relation to forward subordinate states, the non-interference in internal affairs we've heard, and that's correct. China doesn't care whether it's dealing with a, a, a Malaysian liberal democracy, so-called, or a military government in Thailand or Myanmar, or autocratic regime like Cambodia, as long as it works with China. It does it through cooperation, through economic influence, through state and, and, and private Chinese enterprises, and, and they run rampant all over the place. And China does it because it needs resources for its development. It offers development assistance and con concessional loans, uh, creates trade dependency and Chinese enclaves. And I base some of this on a student of mine who is from a particular country in Southeast Asia and studied the relationship between his country and China in great detail. And then China has forged bilateral strategic partnerships under a variety of names globally, 24 types of partnerships with 78 countries. Next slide, please. Now to take this to Asia. The one China policy was a way of buying China's view that, there's a, that Taiwan should not be independent and everybody has to subscribe to that to have relations with China. And then to forge a whole series of economic uh, cooperation arrangements with ASEAN and China, goods and services, uh, to create an ASEAN China free trade area, uh, to participate in the regional comprehensive economic partnership and push the, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Maritime Silk Road. And in the case of the Asian Infrastructure Bank, allow foreigners on the board, uh, but create alternate institutions, the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and the Asia Bank. Next slide. And in Asia, the create its own security organization, sort of out of Southeast Asia, the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization in Central Asia. And then on this partnerships with Singapore, it's an all round, uh, strategic partnerships with ASEAN, Brunei, and the Philippines, and comprehensive strategic partnerships with the rest uh, of the region is listed below. So those are the mechanisms, uh, the conduits, if you will, for influence. Next slide. But uh, ends, ways, and means how? Through three warfares from 2013, guidance to the PLA, public opinion, psychological, and legal warfare. L lawfare in the South China Sea is really preeminent. To repeat, displace the U.S., subordinate Japan, and disrupt U.S. alliances. Assert its indisputable sovereignty and historic rights in the maritime domain. Off Natuna Islands, of course, that's China's historical waters, they would say. To build artificial islands, militarize them, and use them for forward operating bases to intrude and disrupt and harass Malaysian oil exploration with the Philippines and Vietnam. And then the gray zone operations in the South China Sea, not using military actors, but the Coast Guard, maritime militia, fishing fleet to harass the commercial operations of countries in their own exclusive economic zones and to intimidate uh, fishermen uh, like the Filipinos in their own areas. Next slide. Now in Southeast Asia, we've heard this uh, uh, very well from uh, Jason, it's congested. Post the, the liberal international system under US hegemony is in decline and under challenge. There's no question. The beacon on the hill democracy of the United States, all you have to do is turn on an American TV station any day and look at the, the, the polarization that's going on in Washington itself. The hub and spoke systems has decayed. Uh, uh, in fact, the spokes, uh, US, Australia and Japan, pick up the slack. Um, uh, where American leadership is faltering or has faltered. The Quad is a work in progress and it will become, uh, looks like more important when the leaders have their first face-to-face -face meeting. And to re repeat themes already heard, China has become the main rival and competitor uh, uh, of the United States. It's the biggest trade partner with, with Southeast Asia. 
And every time the US Navy deploys, does freedom of navigation, naval presence, bomber task force, uh, you get a reaction by China. And that's intensified in the last 18 months. And it's likely to intensify because the US is going to be stepping up these presence operations unless it's distracted by the Middle East, which is a boon to China. And the use of economic coercion against Australia, and I'll leave that for question and answers, uh, which is why, I mean, I think that that action is widely known. And finally, please, how do we reduce the threat? And I go bilaterally and, and multilaterally. And, and I pick up Jason's point about you countries have agency, we all do. Uh, China has exercised san sanctions on us, but it's buying our iron ore, and we're actually making more money than we're losing at the moment, although certain industries uh, hurt. Uh, we have to develop a whole of government strategy. There's no question about that. And even though we may give lip service to it, we really have to make it work. And we must nurture national unity so it cannot be exploited by China. China's made inroads on our Chinese population that are Australian citizens. Self-help. Uh, every country must do appropriate spending for defense and security, build up maritime domain awareness, the law enforcement agencies, naval air forces, uh, to have a difference in, in defending national sovereignty. But at the same time, continue to engage China diplomatically and politically, and stress not Chinese hegemony and acquiescence to it, but a multipolar, or to quote Amitav Acharya, maybe a multiplex, more complex regional order. I think that's what's evolving. So you still have the US as a great power, but I think its role as a gemin is, is gradually being displaced, but not necessarily to China. That void can be filled and we'll see that multilaterally. And to conduct public information campaigns to assert the national interest and to counter China's narrative. And we're hearing that tonight, which is good to hear. And finally, if we could turn to the multilateral uh, approaches. Uh, next slide. I know these are hackneyed terms, ASEAN centrality and autonomy. But in the ASEAN outlook uh, on the Indo-Pacific in which Indonesia made a major input, it really was a clarion call not to take sides. And that was Jason's second point, be careful of binding one to the other. But, and it's difficult and not all ASEAN is going to agree, but I think the core of ASEAN that, that accepts that principle needs to pursue it. Priority, I say to the East Asia summit and the role of dialogue partners. Now I, I have, was leaked a copy of the penultimate draft of the ASEAN outlook and all of Vietnam's attempts to strengthen the role of a leaders led forum were diluted. But the East Asia summit where you meet and have a retreat is a place to put the US and China on notice, but you're balancing them to let them know you're not acquiescing into China's hegemony and you're asserting your uh, independence. And therefore you must, a corollary to that, and that's on a side trip here, be more strong on, on trying to resolve the Miramar uh, crisis. Withhold, back to my constructivist intervention from the beginning, withhold social recognition of China as a hegemon. Yes, you can, it's a great power. Fine, China, we let you know, but you are not going to rule the roost. We are masters of our own future as well. Assert economic interdependence, and this is a comprehensive um, progressive agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, can the US be enticed, the Biden administration, to join? Of all the institutions out there, the ASEAN Coast Guard is it's moving along at a very slow pace without much effect. And that needs to be strengthened. Many coalitions with literal states. And then finally, ASEAN has an ASEAN plus three on the economic side because of a financial crisis with China, Japan, and South Korea. And I advocate once the Quad gets established, ASEAN could add that as one of its dialogue partners or et cetera. And so the ASEAN plus four. So ASEAN centrality is to balance China's push to displace the US, but to keep US uh, in the region as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, Alan Dyers. And again, you know, we got a lot of uh, important points you know, presented by uh, Alan Dyers. It's uh, uh, 
starting by uh, looking at the uh, four aspects of the uh, China's hegemony, the proper and uh, powers, leadership, relationship, hegemonics, and subordinates in the structure of international uh, political systems. It's quite interesting when the, uh, Mr. Tyers um, argue that the strategy of China um, uh, hegemony is by uh, or in order to keep the CCP in power, uh, natural un uh, national unity and uh, central security, uh, um, uh, national security. Okay, by strategies uh, in terms of economics, uh, uh, by uh, increasing um, uh, what's called it, cooptation, you know, by economics uh, influence, um, strategic partnerships, you know, by uh, strategic partnership with the countries and regions, and also uh, politically, you know, by applying what's called an interference. But uh, quite interesting when. Uh, Mr. Alan Tyers um, suggests a couple of things about uh, how to reduce the China threat. You know, uh, uh, the first one is uh, the nature of national unity. And then the second one, the engage with China or the um, uh, uh, campaigns, in the public information campaigns uh, uh, by what you call it, counter China narratives. You know, I think it's uh, really uh important too you know, which is uh, sometimes you know ignored by the uh, publics in the uh, regional countries and then uh what you call it uh, one thing that we can also discuss uh, uh further uh, the statement by uh players about the asian centrality the uh, important of the ASEAN centrality, which is do the ASEAN centrality or sorry, the ASEAN principle is really, you know, need to be reviewed or redefined in, in, in order to dealing with the uh, uh, China threats, you know, and this uh, situation. Okay, thank you once again. So, uh, Alan Tayers, and now we move to uh, Anna Agung by Uparwita, and as uh, other speaker, you have. Uh, maximum 15 minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much, moderator, and Dr. Ari Sman from CSEAS for inviting me to this uh, very interesting topic. Am I, am I audible enough to you all? Am I audible enough? Yes, Paul, okay. yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, allow me to start with uh, giving you this uh, simple question as my uh, title. Well, for some people, yeah, for some people, these questions can be very problematic in uh, the way, in the sense that it is quite difficult to answer, to respond to these questions uh, uh, comprehensively. But for the other, yeah, these questions can also be answered quite easily. Is China the new hegemonic? Well, some people may say probably not, at least not naturally. Then is a China a leading power of Asia? Uh, or is China more, much more powerful? Uh, yes, but is China a hegemon? Probably not. So it depends on our uh, uh, perception. It depends on our standpoint. And of course, it will be much depend on our perspective. So uh, next slide, please. So allow me to start with this uh, simple quotations. And I really would like to underline what uh, Connie has mentioned in her uh, last slide, when she mentions about it is very important to understand its other. So I think this is this quotation is quite interesting from Albert Einstein that peace cannot be kept by force, but it can only be achieved by understanding. What does it mean to understand its other? How, to what extent can we understand China? And to what extent also China can understand us uh, and Asian countries, uh, including, for example, Australia and, 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 and New Zealand in that context. So again, understanding, understanding is very important. And I do agree with uh, Connie has mentioned in uh, her last slide. Next, please. Okay, I show you, uh, well, basically my, uh, my presentations can be divided into two uh, big themes. How can we see China in the global diplomacy, especially in the global health diplomacy, and then on the uh, issue of, for example, uh, its involvement in uh, United Nations in, uh, uh, in, in the global uh, system. 
by by looking at this uh, simple cartoon, I think we can have a lot of different interpretation. But something that I can uh, tell you that this is a global fraction race, and whether we like it or not, yeah, whether we like it or not, whether we agree or di uh, disagree, there is a very tight competition among nation states to produce the best COVID vaccine. Yeah? And that is the, uh, that is the, uh, the fact. And Chinese COVID-19 vaccine has been delivered to more than 80 countries for emergency use and even for market. Among them, 53 countries receive vaccine for uh, free, including some developing countries uh, in Africa and some uh, strategic important Asian countries like in Pakistan and in Philippines. And 70, sorry, and 27 middle, middle income countries paid for doses, including Indonesia. So what does it mean? It means that China is going to show the world that China has won the vaccine diplomacy war in the context of COVID. So then how can we interpret this? Is China a hegemonic power or a new leading superpower? Again, our interpretations can be varied, depends on our perspective. The next slide, please. So at least we can see that there is a new arms race, quote unquote. So this kind of situations, of course, has created a new geopolitical game changer and reshaped global and regional order. According to Stacey Gordon and Daniel Hexen, there are at least five instruments that can be used by any countries. And I would like to underline what Jason Young has mentioned, because any nation state will always try to protect, to advance and to promote its national interests. And many great powers, they have similar behavior. And China did this as well, using its military, economic, diplomacy, culture, and symbolic instruments. By using vaccine diplomacy, vaccine uh, 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 instruments, we may also uh, interpret China in that context. So is there any, let's say, strategic rivalry between US and China? The answer is yes, there is a strategic rivalry and strategic competitions. And also, I also do agree with Jason uh, when he mentioned that it depends on how we are going to respond to that kind of strategic rivalry and strategic competition between US and China. And this is something that I would like to underline. And then of course, are we talking about multilateralism? Conceptually speaking, yes. Multilateralism does matter. But if we can go in more detail, I think we have to be able to distinguish between hegemonic and concerted multilateralism. What is hegemonic multilateralism? Hegemonic multilateralism is the situation when there is one single superpower trying to dominate everyone. In NATO, for example, not Atlantic Treaty Organization, there is a hegemonic multilateralism when US dominate any other nations in the context of NATO. And what is the concept type multilateralism? Concept type multilateralism is trying to prepare a policy coordination among nation states in dealing with some particular issues. So in that context, for example, when I am taking the issue of pandemic 19, COVID-19, then we need what we call as concert type coordinations, multilateralisms among nation states under the auspices of WHO, for example, in order to deal with COVID-19 pandemic comprehensively. So if we are talking about multilateralisms, I do agree with Professor uh, Thayer, we are talking about multilateralism, but in my opinion, it is very also important to distinguish between hegemonic multilateralisms and concept type multilateralism. And these two concepts are totally different in the implementation. Next slide, please. So the US China rivalry. Yes, I took this from CNBC. The US will be formidable competitor to China in COVID vaccine diplomacy. And of course, the question can be then, will China replace the US? Or is there any a new shape of new global and regional order in the contemporary IR. I do agree that we have to uh, pay attention 
uh, quite a lot in the context of uh, foreign policy and defense policy. So basically in that context, we have to, to take into account the importance of the instruments of the implementations of the instruments of foreign policy in order to achieve their respective national interests. Next, please. Now, allow me to give you a very simple example on how China involved in multilateralism in the context of the UN. The title from the center of a new American century 2019 is very provocative. Take a look, the People's Republic of the UN and China's hegemony, People's Republic of the UN. What did this report uh, report? Well, China is increasingly uses its economic, political, institu institutional power, every instrument that they have. And I think, as I, as, I, as I have mentioned earlier, any nation state will do this. But does it mean hegemony? Because in that report, and President Xi Jinping also mentioned that, we need to democratize international relations. And this is what we call as democratization of international relations, because according to China, we need to give greater voices to developing countries in the global governance system. And of course, this uh, bombastic words, democratization of international relations has invited a lot of sympathy from any developing countries, especially in Africa, Latin America and Asia. But the question back then, does it mean a hegemony? Again, it is quite difficult to, 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 to respond comprehensively. But we can see that the involvement of China in the international organization has been so has been increased so rapidly, especially from 2000 to 2020. So you can see the graph, the China involvement in the UN multilateral system. The next one is, slide please. By this slide, I would like to show you how US and China in a comparative study involvement in the UNPKO. And you can see that China is now increasing, and I took this from the UN website, its role and contribution in the UNPKO and has now risen as a growing actor in peacekeeping operations worldwide. You can see from the simple three graphic here, the total China peacekeeping uh, uh, personnel has been increased dramatic, uh, drastically compared to US, the China's contribution and so on and so forth. So compared to US, for example, China has left US behind. But the question back then is, is it a hegemony or what? But, the, but the, the fact is China has increased its role in the UNPKO. Take a look at the next slide, please. And this is the top 10 contributions of UN peacekeeping forces yeah, in 2020. And take a look at the top 10 contribution. Most of them are developing countries. Bangladesh, the biggest one, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Nepal, India, Pakistan, Egypt. Indonesia, then China. Where are the Western, the so-called Western countries here? And this will invite a lot of sympathy from the world that China has become, let's say, a new, quote unquote, peace guarantor of the world. Why? Because China doesn't have any culture to colonize, to uh, occupy, any other countries physically? A new superpower or hegemony? Again, back to that question. So then I think it's very important for us to pay uh, this kind of situation when we are uh, trying to answer the questions whether China has become a hegemonic or even will China become a trade? Take a look, the next slide, please. I think, uh, I took this from the uh, newest book, 2021. The title is The PLA Beyond Borders, China's Military Operations in Regional and Global Context. But the point is on how to protect the national interests of China without you know, jeopardizing the global and regional stability. And of course, we can further uh, discuss about this, especially when we are going to talk about the role of uh, China in, on, uh, in the South China Sea. Next, please. 
Take a look at our region. And I took this from geopolitical future. Basically, this region has been surrounded by the US naval air facility, US naval base, and naval station area, and so on and so forth. So if we if we if we ask, is China a threat? Well, China can become a threat to the US hegemony. Some of you may disagree with me. That's okay, because we can further discuss. But I think that China will become a threat to US hegemony, particularly in our region. And so that is the reason why we need, for example, Jason, uh, Professor Thayer has mentioned, we need a kind of, and also uh, Bakoni, Ibukoni, Mamkoni, talking about we need a new balancer. It could be a yes. So next, I think that will be my, uh, this will be my last slide. Will China become a potential threat to the surrounding countries in the region? Uh, from Mingxia, uh, 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 a very uh, interesting article in New York Times, three factors. If we are going to, 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 to relate in the context of ideological factor, yes. Feramala has mentioned about the speeds of Pompeii and Pence that China has become a threat to Asia. Even the last visit of Mike Pompeii, the Secretary of US, uh, the US Secretary of State, in front of the leader of Islam moderate Indonesia, he directly mentioned that China is a threat because of communists. Do we agree with that? Well, my simple opinion, I'm not really agree with that. I'm not going to buy that kind of argument. Geopolitical and economic factor, yes, probably. If we are talking about geopolitical factor, and especially when we are uh, pay attention, we are paying attention to the newest uh, Japan, uh, Japan's defense, uh, defense white paper, when Japan for the first time in history mentioned the peace and the security of Taiwan Street is very important and Japan is going to join the US if China do something worse to Taiwan. Yes, geopolitical and geoeconomic factor. Last but not least, I think the collapse of China. And this is because of the inability of the government of China to handle the 1.5 billion uh, people population. And if they are, uh, if they fail to, let's say, to provide basic needs for the people, then the collapse of China can become a possible or potential threat to us. Thank you. And I do hope this uh, uh, short presentations will be very useful to you all. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Banyu Perwita. Um, I think quite interesting when you look at the, uh, some things you know, uh, seems to be ignored by many uh, researchers said, uh, and practitioners. It's about the aspect of, let's say, the uh, current you know, issues like uh, vaccine diplomacy or how the China using a kind of a vaccines production as a part of a strategy, for example, so not to lead uh, uh, in, in, to, lead, to be a uh, leaders in, uh, in the global you know, issues and also game changers and also, but uh, what interesting too, when you said that the uh, uh, when you raise some questions, you know, you are not really, uh, uh, what do you call it, you know, um, sure about whether the uh, the uh, the growth of China as a superpower now means uh, kind of hegemony or uh, leading powers, you know, it's quite interesting, you know, to discuss. And then uh, uh, there's kind of question here, you know, by looking at the uh, uh, some uh, what you call empirical you know, uh, uh, information you know, about the what the China has done so far. Um, let's say it's about uh, will China uh, uh, will replace U.S. as a global hegemony? It's quite an interesting question. <laughs> but uh, looking at the three factors that. Uh, Banyu Parvita said it still uh, can be a source of the great debates among the uh, 
uh, researchers and also the practitioners, including among us. Okay, thank you very much once again, Sir Banyu Parwita. And then we next to the last speaker. And please, uh, Mr. Ben Blanch. Uh, Selamat minutes. sore dari Sydney. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, uh, Pat Daphne and the Centre for Southeast Asian Studies for having me to speak today. And thanks to all the other speakers. I enjoyed your presentations. And um, in the in the uh, shadow of Albert Einstein, I'll try to bring a bit of understanding to this debate uh, in, in my own small way. Um, I don't have any PowerPoint, but I'm going to try and answer three important questions. Firstly, what does China want? Secondly, how is Asia and Southeast Asia in particular responding? And thirdly, how to counter Chinese hegemony in the medium to long term? So the, the first question, what does China want? Well, I think in the policy debate and the academic debate, we see this dichotomy um, between those who say that China and the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping wants to export its system its authoritarian system to the world on the one hand. And we see those who say, no, that's not true. Uh, Beijing only wants to make the world safe for autocracy or make the world safe for the CCP. Um, but I think this is a false dichotomy actually. Why? My own view is that because China is so big and global in its reach economically and politically, socially even, making the world safe for the Chinese Communist Party will necessarily entail Beijing seeking regional hegemony within Asia and a much bigger global role as well. So we end up in the same place. Even if the CCP's aims are limited, its global reach means it has to fight a global campaign and it needs regional hegemony to sustain its position at home. I think it's true, um, reflecting the last speaker, that you know China hasn't shown the kind of imperial ambitions that we saw in the past with previous hegemons. China has no real allies. It has no military bases overseas outside Djibouti. Uh, we'll see what happens in Cambodia. And it hasn't fought a serious war against any of its neighbors since Vietnam in 1979. We also know that the Chinese Communist Party, unlike uh, the Russia, the Soviet Communist Party before it, it has no interest in exporting Marxism, Leninism. It has no interest in the Comintern. But what the CCP does want is to ensure that other states as Carl and others pointed out, Jason too, do not challenge its core interests, its legitimacy, or its emerging dominance. And I think crucial to this is how it sees the US and its alliance system, and particularly in Asia, uh, where the US and its allies are seen by Beijing as a fundamental threat, um, as well as the democratic norms um, that the US and its allies espouse. As Yan Shui Tong of Tsinghua University put it, China believes that its rise to great power status entitles it to a new role in world affairs. And that's one that cannot be reconciled with unquestioned US dominance. So these two big tigers have to necessarily go head to head from a Chinese perspective, whether they like it or not. But having said that, I think we have to acknowledge Beijing has taken a pretty pragmatic approach thus far um, in asserting its position within the region. Sometimes it's true, it does seek to rebalance international institutions or norms. We see that, for example, in the push uh, to advance economic over political rights in various United Nations bodies. Sometimes China defies international norms, um, as we saw with its response to the arbitral ruling on the Nine Dash Line. And sometimes China is looking to create its own institutions or norms through the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or to a certain extent, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, we've had a lot of focus in the last few months on so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. I guess this is seen as the, the less pragmatic aspect uh, of Chinese diplomacy, throwing its weight around. Uh, and that's obviously clear to see, but we have to acknowledge at the same time, China's been getting much smarter diplomatically as well. Look at how it's managed the Uyghur issue in Indonesia, seeking to win support from Muslim groups, uh, Muhammadiyah and U as well, uh, not just looking to buy people off, but looking to explain the issue in terms that they would understand. Uh, look at the way China has responded um, to the Myanmar crisis, where the ambassador on the ground uh, was actually one of the first foreign officials to talk both to uh, the national unity government as well as, as the junta. 
or look at the way that the PLA Navy offered to help Indonesia salvage its sadly lost submarine recently. So China is definitely getting smarter and more ambitious in its engagements with the region. And lastly, on this question of what China wants, I think we can't be too deterministic. Uh, the last speaker said that you know China uh, only seeks kind of peaceful accommodation in the world. It doesn't seek to build an empire. But pretty much all empires in history have been built by accident, right? Um, as, and I think as China's economic and political interests across the region deepen, the risks that it becomes embroiled in domestic politics uh, become greater. And just like the US, the UK and others before it, it risks becoming kind of entrapped into uh, more economic, political, military engagements in the region uh, simply by virtue of how big it is and how, how many interests it has to protect. I think for now, Beijing is still quite cautious and curiously, it sees itself both as a great power that should be a hegemon, but also still as a developing country. So there's an interesting tension there. So how, my second question, how is Asia responding? Um, I see this through the three Ds. Um, Asia is responding through the lens of deference, distrust, and development. Um, so what do I mean by that? Deference, I think we see that across the region, from Japan to Vietnam to Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, Malaysia, Singapore, pretty much every country in the region has a deferential approach to Xi Jinping, to the Chinese government, to the Chinese Communist Party, showing a lot of respect uh, to state leaders, to the party, to China itself. And alongside this deference, there's distrust. Uh, these aren't necessarily relationships even between, say, Hun Sen and Xi Jinping of mutual trust but actually mutual distrust. No one really knows where the lines are drawn. China has no, no formal allies in the region. And the last D is development. So I think every country from the wealthiest, like South Korea and Japan, to the least developed countries, Laos, Cambodia, and the rest, see China as a vital partner for their economic development as their biggest, in many cases, trade partner, a key source of FDI, a manufacturing base for the likes of South Korean and Japanese companies too. So no country in Asia is willing or able to disengage economically from China, apart perhaps from Australia. And we can have a debate about whether Australia is in fact in Asia. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, outside Asia, we often see, uh, you know, in the US, in Australia, other countries, people trying to question whether, which countries are balancing against China, which countries are getting closer to China, but all countries in the region, as I see it, combine this deference and distrust with a pragmatic sense of cooperating China. So if you take the example of, of Vietnam, seen in Australia and the US as this key, key party pushing back against China. Well, the other side of it is that the communist parties of Vietnam and China are, as they say, as close as lips and teeth. And we can have a moment when the general secretary of the Vietnamese and Chinese communist parties are praising their relationship while at the same time, the Vietnamese foreign ministry is protesting the harassment of Vietnamese fishing fleets by Chinese coast guards and militias. And even for the likes of Cambodia and Laos, I'd say, often called vassal states, uh, Bilahari Kastakan, the Singaporean dip former diplomat, even suggested kicking them out of ASEAN. They're also playing their own game here. Of course, they show a lot of deference to China, but distrust too. And they're also distrustful of others around them, Vietnam and Thailand and seeking a different balance in the region. So, so the three Ds, just to reiterate then, deference, distrust, and development, really a pragmatic approach. Uh, and there is a risk here, I would say, that these disjointed responses lead to a kind of path dependency, because everyone is acting on their own, uh, following these pragmatic paths. There's a risk that in the long run, China wins out because of a lack of coordinated responses from the region, which brings me to the third question. And this is as framed in, in the, the framing document for this session. How do we reduce the tensions with China and counter China? Well, well I think the framing of this question gets it a bit wrong. Uh, I'm not sure that reducing the threat of Chinese hegemony and reducing tensions with China are the same thing. In fact, I think they're in tension with each other because to counter the growing Chinese power in the region is going to require an increase in tensions in the short to medium term. If you want to push back against China, you're going to inflame tensions. And if you want to reduce tensions in the short to medium term, you're probably better off not trying to counter Chinese hegemony and trying to simply accommodate it. Now, what do I think people could do that would be more coordinated? 
uh, and might be better than simply every country going its own way, which kind of, as I said, could lead to a, a certain path dependency. It'd be great to see more coordinated, coordinated action between like-minded ASEAN member states and other partners on a range of specific issues that Carl and others have spoken about uh, from maritime domain awareness to other issues. I mean, this sort of action uh, with unilateral action among certain ASEAN members or between certain ASEAN members and others is often seen as a threat to ASEAN centrality or ASEAN unity. I don't think that's the case. I think the real issue here is caution on the part of many ASEAN member states and other nations in Asia. And I think that caution is totally understandable. Uh, it's understandable that governments don't want to upset Beijing. No one wants to be in the same position that Australia is in now, in which case key parts of your economy are being squeezed uh, because you've upset the Chinese Communist Party. The Australian economy is diverse and strong enough to, to resist that. And Australia is geographically very far away. It doesn't have any direct maritime or territorial disputes. It's a very different position, I think, uh, for pretty much every other country in the broader Asia Pacific region. Now, I think coordinated action uh, would be if effective, I think, in pushing back against Beijing. We, we saw that, I think, uh, in a negative sense after the 2016 arbitral ruling, where no governments in the region really stood up uh, with the Philippines, the Philippines' own government, when it changed kind of distance itself somewhat from that ruling. And that meant it didn't have much moral force. Of course, Beijing didn't acknowledge the legitimacy of that ruling in any case. But I think there would have been much more moral force if others had stood uh, with the Philippines. Um, because China wants to play off nations against each other. It suits China, for example, to drag out the code of conduct talks on the South China Sea. It suits China to have ASEAN uh, disorganized and without any unity. But I think we have to acknowledge it's hard even for the closest of allies to take truly coordinated action. We can see that with the Five Eyes, very, very close partners with a long historical alliance among them for intelligence sharing and military cooperation. And we see that New Zealand, for example, is often not willing to sign Five Eyes statements about China. So even those five great partners, the US, UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand can't always see eye to eye, despite their name uh, being the Five Eyes. Um, I think more realistically, ASEAN member states and other Asian nations, uh, rather than just look for this coordinated action that may never happen, they need to focus inwardly on the political, social and economic resilience of their own systems. And partners who care about balance in the region, including the US, here in Australia and in Europe, need to work with ASEAN member states and others to resolve the practical problems they're facing. That's what I think China does really well when I spoke about the third D development earlier, is it brings to bear a lot of investment, uh, growing aid, um, and a lot of uh, trade in, in Southeast Asian countries and a practical approach. We've seen that uh, through, through vaccine distribution in the last few months. There's no point in Washington or Canberra or anyone else telling uh, President Jokowi or the leadership in Laos not to accept investments from China that are framed within the Belt and Road Initiative, that's not going to happen. But what we can do from the outside is help countries in Southeast Asia ensure, for example, that these projects are built to better techn technical, environmental and social standards so that everyone can get the benefits. So in some, if people from outside the region want to help the region to stand up to China, we need to, in a sense, stop talking about China and help ASEAN member states deal with the many practical problems they're facing right now, starting, of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the terrible economic recession uh, that that's brought with it across the region. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ben Blantz. I think it's a very, um, uh, what you know, clear, you know, uh, presentations about uh, the uh, questions whether uh, China is a uh, hegemon or not. Right? By uh, focusing on the three aspects what the China wants, what the uh, regional countries respond, and the uh, impact on long term and the middle term, and what the uh, uh, regional countries has to, to do. And it's quite interesting when the uh, 
Blaine said that the China actually, you know, like the other speaker said, is not really has a kind of historical what's going to legacy on the uh, uh, hegemonic or imperialist um, ambitions you know, in region, or at least in the, still in the question, right? But uh, uh, it is recognized that the uh, China has a national interest to focus on the uh, to fulfill the needs of the oh sorry the domestic uh, national interests of the uh, China itself. Um, uh, it, it, so this why China, according to uh, Brand, is much more uh, pragmatic you know, in, in terms of uh, foreign policies. The, um, and then when we talk about the response of the regional countries, also uh, uh, Brand recognize uh, the uh, that the old countries in the region have their own, uh, you know, uh, or different approach, you know, in response to the uh, China, right? But uh, for the whole, it seems that the the uh, the nature of the response is actually you know, much more uh, pragmatic, you know, rather than let's say more ideological. And uh, Blend also uh, suggest some uh, suggestion, sorry, uh, like uh, how to reduce the tensions uh, between China and the regional countries by let's say whether uh, counter or accommodate the China hegemony. It's quite interesting you know, uh, uh, suggestion. Uh, but uh, Blend uh, quite sure that the corset uh, approach is not really appropriate, appropriate you now in reducing the tension between the uh, China and the uh, regional countries. Uh, what the uh, uh, Blend said uh, suggests is uh, it is a good for the regional countries to what you call it, you know, to deploy the social, economic, and political resilience in their own country, uh, in in dealing with this kind of this. I think so. Um, thank you once again to uh, Ben Blank and other speaker. And now it's time for us to uh, move to the uh, uh, question and answer. Wow, I got a lot of question here. From the participants, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, a lot, at least 14. Now, uh, let me read uh, all the questions and um, please um, make a note for those speakers who, um, you know, uh, supposed to answer the, the question here. The first one is. Uh, uh, Fiji and teacher question to Mr. Paramala. How Uyghur or Xinjiang can arrive in this area and join ISIS if China restrict their living? Okay. Uh, once again, you know, for uh, Mr. Paramala, how Uyghur or, uh, sorry, Uyghur of Xinjiang can arrive in Syria and join ISIS if China restrict their living. And then the second question from Emil, uh, University of Paramadina, Jakarta. And the question to Jason Yang, if China meet with the criteria of becoming hegemony, does China government have the capability in solving existing conflict in some region? Okay. The, the second question. And then now the third question from Francisco's uh, Magister International Relations, uh, um, sorry, uh, where is from? Yeah, okay. The question is, the rise of China in the economics uh, fields, especially the BRI uh, policy, can it benefit in economic prosperity for our country or will it become a burden to uh, for the country in the future? Uh, I think uh, this question can, uh, you know, uh, for all the speaker. And then the second question from Franciscus, with the increasing potential for conflict in Southeast Asia, uh, sorry, South China Sea, with indirectly import Indonesia in the North Natuna Sea, given our national interest regarding the North Natuna Sea, what is the most rational and effective step to prevent and increase in escalation? Is it by encouraging ASEAN to be able to diplomacy with China in order to find the best solution to prevent potential conflicts or 
involving big countries such as United States and Britain as a deterrent effect for security. I mean, more deter China, I think it's me. And then the port question from Nogroho for all speakers. China Strait is uh, South China, in the South China Sea serious or not for the surrounding countries? Okay, and then what is the biggest agenda that the China is preparing in the economic field that possesses a threat to world economies? And then the fifth question from Miranti. Uh, there's no specific uh, uh, question to uh, other speakers. You know? China had initiated a meet in China in 2025 strategic plan and also BRI but with lots of barriers for China do you think that the plan at uh, this plan will work out and how this plan going to rise China hegemony in the global threat and the sixth question uh, well from Tracy's why did China not have clear action about the Myanmar problem when they have enough influence to raise their voice? I think we uh, uh, well, we stop with the question first and then we continue to the next question after the answer uh, from the uh, speaker. Simply because there are too many questions, I think. What do you think, Sine? Uh can we now start to uh, give time for the speaker to answer the uh, six questions already uh, uh, read? Okay. Yeah. Please, yeah. I think it's, we can start from Mr. Uh, Paramala. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, because of the so many questions, yeah. but what we will see is uh, we should. Uh, I mean, we should know that. During the last six years, China has spent one trillion dollars on its defense, developing its defense. Mm. One point zero four trillion dollars in just six years. Uh, so, with that military power, with that economic power, so now China is challenging and ignoring the international rules. For example, in Southeast Asia, uh, so in the South China Sea, for example. Indonesia, which is not a claimant in the South China Sea, what China has right to catch fish in our territory in Natuna, in our exclusive economic zone, which is our right according to the unclosed. And China signed, ratified, it simply ignores. And it enters into the Philippines, it enters into the Vietnam, and it enters into the Malaysia now. It is enter so it is, a, it is a, a, a violating international norms. What we want from China is simply just follow the international rules and just follow the permanent court of Ar arbitration award because which said the China's nine dash line is completely illegal because it signed, agreed that every country has a right to exploit its natural resources in the this uh, to, uh, 200 nautical miles. Okay, that is one, uh, uh, one answer. Mm. The second one is about the Uyghur issue. Somebody asked the question that why uh, Uyghur Muslims uh, entered into uh, Syria. Yeah. We should not forget our own Indonesians entered into Syria uh, from Britain, also Europe, also many people went there. But yeah. what we are saying is you should not punish the whole Muslim community. See now they are punishing 1 million Muslim Uyghurs. You cannot grow beard. You cannot fast. And they are forced to eat uh, for, uh, pork. So these, uh, this kind of discrimination and also like same, same thing happening in the uh, Tibet. So what I'm saying is you, you have the problem of terrorism, separatism, but it is, I mean, only very few individuals, but not the whole entire community. You should not punish the whole entire community. That's why the US and other countries are saying it is a genocide in Uyghur. So uh, that, that is my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's very interesting the first uh, answers that the that the uh, idea how to encourage the international community to make the China is a become a kind of a, 
compliant state, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other speaker you can uh, um, answer the the questions already? But uh, Delphi, may may answer one question, which is uh, okay. Bukuni, okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, I've read this one. Uh, the question is for me. It's regarding uh, Taiwan, Asia. Yeah. So my statement will be very clear that I think like last Wednesday, President Xi stated very clearly that China people don't attack either Chinese people. So of course, I think uh, <laughs> it's not going to do something big or something dangerous to Taiwan. Yeah. But again, uh, I think we we ha really have to to not involving too much on the words of reunification or unification because uh, this is the unification is uh, stated by President Ma. Uh, since 2015 or something. So again, uh, I think China reserved the right to use force to bring Taiwan under the control, but it will strive to achieve peaceful re reunifications or even unifications. Uh, we have to really understand, I think uh, China will be very careful on, on, on taking uh, uh, Taiwan matters, because if you understand the, the historical uh, side of uh, Chiang Kai-shek, whatever now they claim on the on, uh, 11 or 9 days island or whatever island they claim mm -hmm. is actually all the paper, all this, uh, all the evidence and everything is under Taiwan. So even China said anything without the paper or, or, or the proof or legal paper from Taiwan, actually China cannot do anything. So of course, uh, from the China perspective, I think uh, I like the, uh, what President Xi Jinping stated that China will not attack another China. Uh, the second thing, I think I'm going to uh, uh, to, to uh, really underline what Professor Banyu said. I believe, uh, I, I'm agree with you, Prof, because I think if we are uh, trapped uh, to really call the hegemonic of China, it's actually the question is hegemonic to whom? Especially if we are really calculating what is Indonesia power. Again, uh, we have to understand the words only uh, defined by two uh, pl players. The coalition of the willing, United States and all his friends, and the coalition of the non-willing, which is outside that, okay? So of course, uh, now we are talking about uh, the map that uh, Professor Banyu showed us. It actually has to be added by France, actually added by UK, actually it has to be added by Japan, NATO, the Quad, and everything. So I think the idea of uh, making ASEAN plus Quad is impossible because we are on the coalition of the non-willing. I mean, at least Indonesia on the position of the coalition of the non-willing. Uh, that is my uh, 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 statement, and I'm afraid I have to leave because uh, I said to you that I'm still on the <laughs> on the okay. recovery period. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope that I can uh, answer that question because otherwise uh, the other things could be answered by uh, yeah. any other speakers. Again, thank you so much, Padafri. Thank you. For, thank you very uh, much, uh, uh, Ibu Koni, and God help you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Thank you. See you again. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, uh, next uh, speaker, you may uh, answer the question. Uh, hi, um, if it's okay, I'll, I'd yeah. like to answer the question on, um, can China solve conflict in some regions? Because I think it's a really uh, interesting question because it puts, uh, I, th I think it identifies uh, a real weakness of China as a great power in the sense that it's in many ways quite a lonely great power um, compared to other uh, nations of its uh, size and history. Um, and it still acts in, in, a, in a primarily a uni unilateral way for its own interests. Uh, and its focus is still very much on its own domestic development. Uh, when it talks about international relations, it started to talk about uh, its vision for a region or for a world, but most of that is is still very much focused on on China. I, I think if I was to look at, I guess, three different examples very very quickly, the first one would be the Belt and Road Initiative, where uh, at least rhetorically, um, Chinese officials have talked about being a provider of public goods, uh, and I think the jury is still out on that, but it's not going as uh, that well. So there I would give it a perhaps maybe in the future if, if, if Chinese officials can learn and Chinese companies. And then the other two areas would be Afghanistan uh, and, and Burma or Myanmar uh, and whether or not uh, the PRC or PRC officials will be able to somehow broker some kind of stability in those regions. And there I would just put a warning that 
if uh, the PRC does uh, manage to solve conflict in those regions, it won't be solved in the way that potentially we would be used to. So that could be uh, quite an interesting case study to watch. Okay, thank you, uh, Jason Young. Then um, please have any other uh, comment or uh, answer for other speaker. And unfortunately, um, Blen, uh leave the meeting because uh, there's not engagement okay the banyu perwita or uh tire you wanna yeah okay, okay. <laughs> sorry yeah. but because i don't i don't know uh which questions should i respond uh basically but i think i'm just going to make a concluding remark because uh yeah. Yeah. i have another uh, meeting online okay. after this yeah okay well, something that I would like to say that, uh, well, again, some uh, may disagree with me, but that's okay. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that China, like Russia, uh, again, uh, accept the concepts of a multi multipolar world. Yeah. And to some extent, I do agree with this, because in which, uh, in this kind of multi multi multipolar world, there is no, let's say, one specific country can become a hegemony, hegemonic power. Yeah. So uh, I think we have to understand this because collectively we need to solve any problems that we have today collectively together. And a hegemon implies a single, a monopolar world. Yeah. And this is something that, again, as far as I'm concerned, China and Russia did not accept this kind of uh, single um, and hegemonic a power so i think again we need to it's uh, we need to to to, to understand it's other yeah. because a lot of global commons that we have should be handled multilaterally not in hegemonic sense but in a concert type uh, again concert type of multilateralism so that we can find uh, not context the, uh, the, uh, the the context of balance of threat but in the context of the balance of interest among all of us so I thank you, uh, moderator, Pak Dafri, once yeah. again, Pak Dr. Asman, and any other respected speaker. So because I have also to leave uh, the meeting uh, right away. Thank you very much. Baik, terima you. kasih. Thank you, Pak yeah. Banyu. Uh, Baik. Sehat -sehat. Yeah. Salam. Okay, and Mr. Alan, you wanna say something? as a response to the questions. Anyway, you can also look at the uh, chat room, actually. You know, there's some question. Uh, Sorry, uh, are you talking to me? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah. I, yeah. I took the liberty of printing the questions out. Yeah. And there are about three or four on the South China Sea, Yeah. some specifically aimed at me. Uh, one question, uh, you know, has its historical assumption that the West is interfering. Uh, I would take all those questioners to me and say, from, from the ancient kingdoms of Indonesia to what was in Malaysia, etc., pre-colonial era, what was your relationship to the South China Sea? Where did you fish? Where did you travel? Where did you trade? And then now you apply it to the current period where China says we were the first to discover, to name, to administer and occupy the, all the features in the South China Sea. And that anybody like the Philippines or Vietnam uh, that's uh, exploiting hydrocarbons or whatever is stealing our resources. There's an anthropologist who talked about, he had to invent the name, the New Sen Pao people and outriggers that sailed all over the place. So the counter China narrative is, um, you know, the, the question to me seemed, to, oh, why should the, a, a group of like-minded states uh, tell China to get out of the South China Sea? From the 17th century, when Vietnam was divided, the ruling lords in the northern part of the country sent out an expedition every year to what we call the Paracel Islands. Uh, their main mission was to recover cannons from the wrecked ships, because those were very valuable, but coins and any other, and bring it back. 
So Vietnam, and they erected a, a temple uh, and went out there for six months. So Vietnam can, can make an establishment and I'm sure other countries could. So I, I put it that the, the, the claim to historic rights, which is now biting Indonesia in the North Natuna Sea, China says that's our historical fishing grounds. Uh, we have a right to be there. Uh, but yet UNCLOS has superseded traditional uh, uh, patterns. And then is China a threat there? Well, even before the arbitral ru ruling, it was cutting cables and stopping Vietnam's uh, oil exploration. And China in the single draft negotiating text with ASEAN, and I was leaked a copy, says all the marine resources on the South China Sea can only be exploited between the, the national companies of China and countries in the region. And as for military exercises, you should give advance notification in case anybody objects. So China would like to object to military exercises with countries outside the region. What that does is say, Australia, the United States, Japan, South Korea, have no, any other country, France, has no right or no interest in, in the South China Sea. And I think that's a, a misreading of American investment, America's role, uh, as a global power wanting to sail its navy through the South China Sea from Pacific uh, to the Straits of Hormuz, uh, for example. So I, th I think, so the South China Sea is, is contentious because it's wrapped up in nationalism and resources, but what's very little discussed, and I, I just end on it, it was a point that I made, it's to be a bastion for China's nuclear submarines to be able to get out into the Pacific within firing range of the US or when China finally develops the technology to launch a submarine ballistic missile that can strike the United States to have a bastion in the South China Sea with no American naval presence. Um, it's a deterrent, a nuclear deterrent, not an offensive force. So we have to understand that that, that nuclear conflict, uh, no, nuclear rivalry is still there. And it's frightening for the rest of us who aren't nuclear countries, because if one side or the other uses it uh, and the other retaliates, we're all going to suffer. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan Teya. That's a, such a, I think it's a, such a deep uh, answer, I think, to the questions and really uh, enlightening. Now, uh, we still have time you know, for the other speaker to respond for the uh, other participants' question. Please. Okay, hang on. All right. Uh, if no more uh, respond from the speaker and also from the participants, uh, and then uh, I think it's time for us to uh and this uh discussions uh so once again uh, for all speaker participants um i would like to thank you very much for your uh enthusiastic uh parties uh, party participations on this uh discussion after a long discussion, we have then uh, finally arrived at the end of our event. Um, I will not draw the conclusion from discussions. Um, I will leave the conclusion to the committee to be formulated and also to each participant. But um, if I may say that, uh, let me convey that our discussion today was a very productive, generating ideas and information that are very useful for maintaining the economics, political, and security stability in the countries. There are a lot of ideas um, that we can you know, uh, learn uh, from the uh, discussion today. Some of the uh, uh, approach, you know, uh, we see kind of a new approach or, you know, looking at the uh, new aspects of the uh, issues of the uh, China hegemonies in the region. Many thanks to the speakers who have contributed uh, their thoughts and experience to all of us. And also, thanks to all the participants who, again, you know, enthusiastically participate in our discussion today. Finally, I apologize if 
any uh, or there are things that are not facing to all participants and speaker. Thank you and see you in the other uh, opportunity. Terima kasih. Yeah.